Hello and welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumke here with co-host Katie Coronado. Today we welcome two guests to talk about Congress, foreign policy, and American politics. We would like to welcome Michael Capuano, who served as a Democrat from Massachusetts, and Gary Franks, who served as a Republican from Connecticut. Thank you both for joining us today. Good to be here, David and Katie. Yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing some of your expertise with us. Now, you, you, you served in, 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 in different eras. You didn't actually serve together, but, but you both ha had really seminal moments in foreign policy early in your congressional careers. Uh, for you, Congressman Franks, um, you entered Congress right as the U.S. was preparing for the Gulf War to That's evict right. Iraq from Kuwait. And from you, for you, Congressman Capuano, you, just a couple years after you entered the House, uh, the 9-11 attacks occurred. I'd like to, to ask you both to share some of your, your thoughts on approaching those issues, what you were hearing from constituents at the time, and how uh, Congress managed to, to deal with those, those issues. Yes, when I got elected, David, uh, I was the first black Republican in about 60 years. So I was a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, and at that time, there was uh, ex really no person of color that supported the use of force in the Persian Gulf War situation back in those days. So it was a very tough position to be in as the only person of color to, to support it. It was my first vote <laughs> when I got there, and they said, okay, here we go. We're going to get started with, with the, uh, <laughs> that's right, life, and, life or death type of uh, situation. So I had outside pressures. I had the pressures of, uh, of this black community uh, because many people thought that more black people would be in front of the line, but I had the comfort of Co General Colin Powell, who I met with uh, several times. I was also ranking member of the Readiness Subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee. So I was well-schooled and, and taken over to the White House several times. So it was a difficult vote and uh, overwhelming force did work. We got the job done and we got out and that was a good thing. Excellent for you. And, you, and for you, Congressman. Well, 9-11 was a little different uh, in the sense that there really wasn't much. As soon as it became clear um, that Al-Qaeda had done this. Uh, and then we actually, people tend to forget that we actually asked the government of Afghanistan, the Taliban, um, who everybody knew were bad people before 9-11, but they were bad people only to the, within their own country. We asked them several times to let us go get Al-Qaeda. And they refused. They took Al-Qaeda's side. People forget this. Um, and it became very easy uh, for, for most, almost everybody that, to just say, look, they just killed 3,000 of our people. And remember, Boston lost a fair number of people that day. Um, so for us, even though we are the center for the most part of the usual, the typical peace movement and anti-nuclear movement, uh, in this particular case, this was, uh, I, I didn't have almost anybody think that we shouldn't go to Afghanistan for the purposes of getting Al-Qaeda. Now, I will tell you that several years later, um, it, people have changed their mind. I've didn't change my mind, but they, the, the government, the U.S. government changed the, the goals in Afghanistan from getting Al-Qaeda now to rebuilding Afghanistan, which is not what we voted for. So that, that particular vote was very easy. For me, the difficult vote was the one that came soon after that, the Patriot Act. Uh, that was an issue that a lot of people were afraid that there were terrorists under their bed. Um, I personally thought that the Patriot Act, I still think to this day, the Patriot Act was a victory for the terrorists. Um, they didn't destroy this country by taking down buildings and killing 3,000 of our people. They undermined this country by changing who we are. A and that was a beginning of changing who we are, saying that the U.S. government, we trust the government to know what library books we take out. We trust the government to collect telephone information. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a liberal Democrat, no matter how you measure it, but that doesn't mean I trust the government with information they don't need to have. I voted against the Patriot Act. That was a, a more difficult vote at that time. Uh, but I think it's since so quickly came to be seen as the right vote. The much more, the, it, it wasn't difficult, but the much more confusing issue was not too long after that uh, going into Iraq in, in that there was a lot of theoretical evidence. It was a unified uh, discussion. It was all over the place that, you know, this is, we have the weapons of mass destruction. For me, they never convinced me that they did. They, they had no proof whatsoever. Uh, they didn't have a, an international regime that nobody else other than the Bush administration thought there was weapons of mass destruction there. Um, there was no proof of it, of any kind. Uh, and I will tell you, I looked at every single ounce of intelligence I could get my hands on, and there was nothing there. Um, and it doesn't, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, this Saddam Hussein was a good guy. He wasn't a good guy. Um, 
but they didn't have weapons of mass destruction, and even if they did, there were other ways to deal with it. So that it was there was a little touchy vote because there was still a lot of a lot of uh, spillover from 9/11, and even to this day, you'll see people who think that you know that, that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9/11, and he didn't. Uh, and there's you know, there's no factual evidence that to that nature. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, but nonetheless, it, because of both the emotional thing of sending you know young men and women to die, is a different. I think is a is a sacred vote in my personal opinion. Um, but also what it's done to this country, it, you know, the Patriot Act and the whole argument about what the country should be, uh, a whole role in the international regime now. Uh, it, it, it was the beginning of, in my opinion, a very difficult and not necessarily a good. Um, period of history for American international relations. I think they're still going on today. We are still living the ramifications of that today. And of course, Congressman Franks mentioned his vote in Iraq. There was a plan to also get out after that a limited right. period of time. That is right, we had an exit plan. Act. General Colin Powell convinced the administration, George W., George H. W. Bush, that if you break it, you own it. And unfortunately, I agree with Mike, with Afghanistan, you know, we've, uh, We've owned it for 18 years or more, that's, that's un which is un very unfortunate. I know. We're speaking about international affairs here, and do you believe that Congress impacts foreign policy, and can you give us some examples? Well, for me, I had uh, to work on a number of trade issues. Uh, NAFTA was a big issue during the early 90s, highly controversial because people thought that jobs would be leaving. America. Uh, um, others thought that uh, if we help the people in Mexico increase their income, they could purchase more U.S. goods. So that was a big issue. And then I also had most favorite nation with China as a big issue. And that was a more parochial issue for me because a lot of, uh, of my companies in my, in my state were looking to sell more merchandise in China, like uh, United Technologies wanted mm -hmm. to sell their carrier air conditioners in China. And so there was a lot of pressure to, to, to look at uh, issues from an economic perspective, and, and, and my constituents were very much in, in tune with that. Um, I was not in Congress when the whole discussion on climate change, change uh, you know, obviously Mike was there for that. But uh, we had a lot of trade issues that were very, very important to my constituents and to the nation that we had to look at and deal with. And the U.S. is still the most important international player on every issue. We, may, we are not the only one. We have never been the only one, but we are by far the most important one. And that's for good and bad. Uh, when we make a bad decision, it impacts the world. When we make a good decision, it impacts the world, but it generally goes less recognized, um, which always bothers me. I mean, people want to focus only on the bad, the Iraqs, uh, uh, the Iraq type of decision. But we are still the leading democracy in the world. And people tend to forget that, and I think we need to remind people of that. And I, I, I tell the story all the time about not just one, but many trips, but particularly one trip where, you know, I took the side of defending the U.S. government against another government that was arguing that we had made a mistake in Iraq, which I agreed we did make a mistake. We made a mistake, as far as I'm concerned. That doesn't mean we're evil or we're, you know, colonialists or any of that kind of stuff. We're not, uh, and we're never going to be. I hope. So. No matter how you look at it, on, on war and peace, on the economy, on trade, the U.S. is by far and unequivocally the leader of the world. Uh, and I actually think that the, the, the real debate is how we embrace that role. You know, and there are some administrations that embrace it, and there are some administrations that you know, don't touch it at all or don't like it. They'd rather be isolationists. It's a little overstatement to make the point. But that's the argument that goes on in Washington, and actually in the country a lot, goes on in trade deals. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, I, I, I was there when we voted on, on most favored nations as well, and for, for, for uh, China and others, and I voted against it. Not because I don't want to trade with China. I do. And in my, I, had, I had a district that actually had a trade surplus because of what we didn't manufacture things. We were mostly in intellectual property. Um, but there was no, <laughs> why would I want to trade with a country? Every time they, 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 when they make shirts, when they used to make shirts in Massachusetts, you know, we were the textile manufacturers of the world for a long time. Uh, when they started making them in China, paying children, you know, 10 cents a day, you know, to work in a factory for 14 hours a day, the price on my shirts didn't go down. And you know, so therefore, it, t take a deep breath here, guys. I'm not against trade, I'm all for it, you know, but it has to be trade on a fair and level playing mm -hmm. field, which of course is a measure of the eye, in the eye of the beholder, I know that. But for me, it, 
almost never has been. Our trade deals over the years have been, for the most part, one-sided. And I think we've given a lot of things away. That doesn't make trade bad. It means we, I think we've entered that new era. And I, I'm actually glad we're here uh, now. So yes, the U.S. is still a leader, always, I don't know, but for a long time has been, and will be for a long time in the future, as far as I can see. Going back to what you mentioned about colonialism and that we're not evil and we're not bad, uh, what's your take on, and I'd like both of your takes on, uh, what's happening in Venezuela? My opinion is it's, it's a fair question. I mean, Venezuela has a real problem, but not unusual. It's one of the many countries that happens to be their turn at the moment. We've been through similar things in Nicaragua and El Salvador and Panama. Uh, we'll get through this, and my hope is that we'll get through it reasonably soon, we being the world, not just the U.S. And in the end, I think, like many of the other countries, it will be an improvement for the people of Venezuela. Um, there's going to be some pain in the meantime. My hope is that the U.S. doesn't make a stupid mistake um, to over-engage. But mean, do you think we should be there right now? We, we, should, we have a role to try to work it out. Uh, I don't think we should be there militarily, if that's the question. No, I don't. Uh, at least not now and maybe never. But. I, I, though I'm a liberal, I don't ever say never to something that, that could change. In a place like Venezuela with the people who are involved, there could be you know, genocide tomorrow. And then, not that there is, but that could happen. If that happened, I might change my mind. At the moment, no, it's a, it's a typical political problem. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be unengaged. We should be engaged, just not militarily. And I agree. I, I just think that uh, the United States getting out there and being uh, the savior to the world is something that um, you know, I don't advocate. We have too many problems here in the United States. And, and when you look at the, uh, the fact that there are not enough jobs in, in certain communities, and the, the diversity uh, aspect of, of looking at individuals and saying, hey, you know, let's have more people in color in these major corporations and, and let's promote individuals and, and let's uh, see how you handle terminations of individuals and see if there are any disparities. I, I'm more for economic development here in the United States. The trillions of dollars or trillions of dollars that we, that, are, that we spent in Afghanistan, I believe we could have almost repaired every single road in the United States. And so I'm not, uh, I feel for the people of Venezuela and I, and I know that uh, from a humanitarian perspective, we as Americans would do whatever is necessary. But as far as uh, intervening, I agree with Mike, there's no need to have any type of intervention from the United States. Well, well let me ask you this, and this, this, this kind of goes to the core of, you know, House of Representatives and what it is to represent people. There's often a disconnect between foreign policy and even trade and the, you know, your, your constituents. So what issues are important to the average voter? And, you know, what, what motivates you as a, a member of Congress to actually get involved in, in foreign policy issues? My, my district's a little bit different than most. Uh, you know, I, foreign policy is actually discussed around the dinner table on a regular basis in mine. Um, but that is unusual, and I know that. At the same time, every constituent around the world, not just in my district or anybody else's district, has the first issue of being first. How do I feed my kids? How do I educate my kids? You know, How do I make a living? How do I keep the house going? That's always first, always has been, always will be. Um, we don't really get into the next issues in general until those things are settled. So when the economy is doing reasonably well, that's when you start getting into other issues. And when the economy is not doing well, the only issue people want to talk about, again, that's an overstatement to make the point, um, is, wait a minute, what about me? And once I'm taken care of, once I feel like I can eat and my kids have a future, um, then I'll be willing to listen. Honestly, that's, I got involved deeply with uh, Sudan and South Sudan was awfully hard to get people to pay attention for a long time because, you know, the economy was a question at the time and nobody knows where Sudan is and, it was, you know, there's no TV cameras there. And um, But at the same time, we still found an awful lot of people who wanted to do the right thing, even in a place that, in theory, on paper, wouldn't matter to a certain extent because they understood that humanity is still humanity no matter what your nationality is. Briefly, how me, did you? Can, sorry. Yeah. I was going to respond to that. Uh, thanks to the former members of Congress organization that they're hosting us today as well. I went to uh, to China about a year right. or so ago. And even when I was in China, I talked about economic fairness and about diversity and about looking at trying to uh, um, have trade deals with, with companies that actually employ people of color and that promote people of color and in, in, a, in a way in which it's equitable. And so I'm just extremely, as you can tell, sensitive 
to the fact that diversity in our country and compromise are probably the two elements that, that's missing today that to me, that not missing, but can be improved upon, I should phrase it that way, that will make us a much stronger country and a much stronger democracy when everyone feels as though they're, they're participating sure. in the system fully and fairly. So I said that in China to, to, to Chinese leaders. I said, why don't you look at investing in companies that, uh, that actually have a strong record of showing that they employ people of color, promote people of color, do not terminate people of color in an unfair type manner, pay people of color properly. And I'm willing to bet and, that the companies in China said, thank you very much for coming. Well, Next. you know, <laughs> they talked about a lot of different uh, topics. And, you know, and there's no question they've said Change that. Change that subject. They've, they've said that, but I, as the only <laughs> black at the table, it, it was my obligation. <laughs> and I think the first black to go to, to China okay. in this capacity as a former member, to let them know that there is a great deal of sensitivity out there. And though they don't see Martin Luther King or Jesse Jackson or other people of, right. of that nature talking about it, well, there's a Republican congressman who's talking about economic development and fairness across the board because I think it's a topic that uh, should be discussed. You mentioned about Sudan that people were like, where is that? And, and their interest wasn't there, right? And so well, and how, you, how did you do it that? Was, it, we didn't succeed as much as I would like to, but the, the success we did have was basically working with outside groups to educate their members, a lot of actually religious groups on, of all kinds of religions, and we made some progress. Uh, you know, the progress might be short-lived, who knows, but you, know, you, you do what you can do. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you just delay uh, down the road and when it comes to Sudan. I think we made some progress. You, know, you can always do better, but it is not a solved problem by any means. I want to I want to turn back to where, where you started. You had mentioned uh, trade, NAFTA, and China, most favored nation status, which, of course, passed in the era where there was President Clinton and a Republican Congress. Uh, right. And it required bipartisan support to get both those passed. This is a hyperpartisan era, obviously, right now. Um, is bipartisan cooperation still possible on foreign policy and trade issues right now? Um, the problem, one of the problems we have, uh, David, is that uh, because of the gerrymandering of districts, it has created a polarization in, in, in politics that would cause one side to say, if you say up, the other side's going to say down, and there's nothing in the middle. And why can they do that? It's because they do not fear losing their general election. Because in many instances, if Mother Teresa ran against them, they would still win. And so uh, it wasn't like that when I served. So the districts were not as gerrymandered as they are today. Now, Democrat dis districts are super Democrat districts. Republican districts are super Republican districts. And it started back in the 90s when I was in Congress because they created right. ma majority, minority, congressional districts. And I always said, you don't have to pack all black people into one district in order to get a black elected. I was elected in a 4% black district, 92% white district, and got elected six times, three times to Congress, three times to city council. And I know that white people would vote for a black person. Now, obviously, years later, everyone found that out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the bottom line of it is the polarization is hurting us. They took the racial gerrymandering and turned it into political gerrymandering. And the American people should stand up and, and really say, hey, wait a minute, the census is coming up in 2020. Don't allow the politicians to decide who votes for them. <laughs> don't don't, don't You're, allow them to, to, to right. determine so their makeup because they're going to serve their own interests. But maybe some way, I don't know the way, I don't have the answer for that, David, but there has to be a way yeah. in which we can create congressional districts that are not gerrymandered. There was one district in, in Georgia that went from Atlanta to Savannah. I mean, absolutely, right. <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. There was one district in North Carolina that was joined only by an I-95. Uh, so that has caused a situation where compromise has become very, very difficult sure. because of the fact that you're, you're red and you're, you're blue and, and un unfortunately uh, there's no penalty for doing nothing. <laughs> so if you do nothing, if you do sure. nothing, right. You've, you've appeased your base in some instances, and, and that is sad. Do you, do you agree with this, Congressman? Or? Not that much, because nobody has a solution. People have their prejudices. People are going to bring their prejudices to the table. Either elected officials or unelected officials all have prejudices, and they will all bring them to the table. I would rather have the people making decisions like this who are held accountable by their electorate, period. 
Um, number one. Number two, you asked a question about trade. Do I think it's possible? Yes, I think it's possible. But it's got to be led, and it's got to be it's got to be something people really want. Uh, as I left Congress, the the big debate at the time where there were two major trade deals going on, one in in Asia and one in Europe. The Asian one is more difficult because a lot of the issues that many Democrats fa uh, talk about are a fair payment of workers, uh, fair treatment of workers, environmental issues, things like that. It's like if you want to trade with somebody, if they're going to enslave their workers, that's not fair competition. Uh, if they're going to pollute their rivers, that's not fair competition. They're going to need to live by not necessarily the same standards we have, but at least something comparable to us. And yet on the other side was Europe. And my argument is if you can't make a trade deal with Europe, you're not trying. Because you know they have all those standards. They pay their workers reasonably well. They're heavily unionized. Um, they have you know all kinds of oh, environmental concerns. It doesn't mean we don't have differences. And yet, right now, it seems like we're more focused on on trying to break Europe up and trying to negotiate with this piece and that piece, as opposed to as a as a collective. And that seems to be the focus. So for me, I think the answer is yes. They can be had. Uh, but th the bigger question is whether there's anybody who wants to lead us to do it. And generally that comes from the White House. Um, and you know, that, and I, I, you'll have to ask Donald Trump why he hasn't done it. And if we have another president tomorrow, you'll have to ask them what they're gonna do on the issue. Uh, Asia does present a different problem. And again, because of the issues I just mentioned, uh, not because we don't like to deal with Asia, it's because, you know, I, no, I, I really don't wanna buy my shirt from a country that has 10 year olds in a factory for 14 hours a day, I don't. Um, and you know, I don't mind doing that if they're if they're in Poland and they're, you know and again the workers have some rights and some and fair treatment, but uh, that's an issue. So the answer I think we can, but I think that um, it's it's going to be a lot tougher now because of the polarization. I don't think the polarization is caused by gerrymandering, but I do think, uh, of course, we have polarization and that's a real problem. You attribute it to the leadership, the current leadership, or in general leadership. It's, it's a it. tough issue. I mean, trade is, is one of those issues that everybody has an opinion on. And, and we did go through a, you know, look, I wasn't there for NAFTA and, 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 and I didn't like those trade deals. And not be, again, I come from New England. We've been trading with Canada for a million years. Um, and again, we're, we're a very international area. We've trade built my region. And so I'm not opposed to it, but I just never saw why you would want to ship American jobs to a place that clearly is moving only for wages. And I need to go back. When Massachusetts lost the textile business, we did not lose it to Mexico. We lost it to North Carolina and South Carolina, mostly for unionization issues. When factories came around to saying, okay, we have to upgrade the factory, we have to spend a gazillion dollars, wait a minute, I'm gonna spend a gazillion dollars, I can go to this state, spend the same gazillion, and end up in, by the way, I'm still gonna have to have 500 workers, I can pay my 500 workers here who are unionized $20 an hour and go down there and pay them $5 an hour, that's kind of an easy answer. They didn't leave. They didn't leave good factories. They left factories that were already 100 years old. They needed upgrade, and so we lost it. The ones who lost those jobs to Mexico and now Burma or wherever else they're making them, it was North Carolina and South Carolina who lost those jobs because companies, rightfully so, they're not doing anything wrong. They have an obligation to the bottom line. That's what they're supposed to do. And when they look at it, they say, well, "Wait a minute, I can make this shirt cheaper someplace else." And it's almost always about labor. Not always, but almost always about labor, labor costs. And again, I, nobody in America right now is gonna work for $2 a day, and nor should they. Congressman Franks, you were very close to George H.W. Uh, Bush. Yes. When you were first elected, he was very instrumental in, in, yes, in your successful campaign for Congress. He also is credited for, have, for being uh, very much a foreign policy specialist with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the plan and a vision. You were just mentioning you went to China last year. Who, who it, it's very clear the Chinese have a vision that's very trade-oriented throughout the globe. Is there a concern that, that America doesn't isn't taking the time to develop a plan? That America doesn't have a plan. And I'd like to ask you, Congressman Capuano, if, if you kind of agree with that notion and, and what should we be doing to kind of get our act together? Well, I hope that today and every day our trade representative is working diligently to make good deals for the United States. Um, and th do I know that? No, but I, I trust that he is. And the bottom line of it is we have to, uh, you know, have faith in, in the leadership and also look at ways in which we can um, you know, recommend options. And, and the American people can do that. You know, we can voice our opinion, like for example, with climate change being a factor today, 
let's see what the ramifications of certain actions would be. China's plan is quite simple. And, and it is not political or governmental domination, it is economic domination. Not necessarily even domination, but just use. If you have bauxite and we need bauxite, we're gonna come and get it. And we're gonna bring our own people in for the most part to take it out. And you know, you're gonna get something, but you're not gonna get much. And, and that's, what, that's what they do, that's their plan. Um, as opposed to our plan, which when we try to do it, it also, in, hopefully, in theory, engages in, in the idea of enhancing democracy. We have strong laws that are not always fulfilled on uh, anti-bribery. I mean, you know, a lot of companies will have to go in in some of these third world countries and bribe the prime minister to be able to take the bauxite out. Chinese have no compunction whatsoever about doing that. We have laws against it. Doesn't mean that our companies don't do it on occasion, but when they do, they get punished for it. So that um, our plan, I think, has to be a longer run plan. Uh, and understand that what America offers, yes, is economic well-being, but it's also the hope for a better life for the people of that country. And the truth is, not every country is run by people who care about the future of their own people. And stealing our intellectual property was an issue we talked about extensively when our delegation was in China, because that is one of the reasons why a lot of companies do not want to do business in China, because they're forced to have a factory there, they're forced to, to, to uh, subject themselves to uh, having their technology stolen. And right now, our trade ambassador is working diligently to make sure that that's curbed, if not eliminated. It's not any, working. Any <laughs> that's not working, you're right. Just, uh, <laughs> just thank you very much for your time. We've run out of time, but uh, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you for joining us today. 